Let's thank Pastor Terry and the church here for hosting this meeting. Just put your hands together. Give this a hand. We absolutely love what we do, but we also love our families, and we're looking forward to jumping on an airplane this afternoon and headed home. Amen. Amen. But the job's not done yet, so we're gonna we're gonna work it a little bit longer before we go. It really has been an incredible time, and you know, I believe as pastors set the stage early in the meeting to be noble like the Bereans and search the scriptures. You know, to me, I don't know why we have to uh, kind of cat dance around everything and can't just share some thoughts and concepts right. and then people do whatever they want to with it. I mean, there's no pressure to you whether you receive what I say or don't receive it. You have to make the decision, is it God, is it not God? Right. One thing I am convinced about is the truth does not speak to you from outside of you. It speaks to you from inside of you. Amen. And your mind may not have known it, but something down inside you said, I knew that. I knew that. I just didn't know how I knew that. But something in me is that, you know, coming alive and it's awake. And, uh, uh, you know, I just, I just believe that's good news. You know, to me, with the gospel is good news. Amen. And I sometimes want to say, what part of good news don't you understand? You know, because yes. people go to church and they don't hear good news and hear bad news. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I heard somebody say one time, uh, you know, they, they, they were talking negatively about Joe Osteen, who I happen to really kind of like. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, everybody said, well, you know, he's the feel good preacher. I said, well, you all leave church and feel better than you did when you went. Amen. Amen. I mean, Come on. You know, what part of good news don't we understand? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If we don't leave feeling better than we did when we came, we probably didn't hear the gospel. Yeah. 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 You feel beat up, and you know, well, you say, well, he's, you know, uh, basic. Well, somebody's got to be entry level. <laughs> yeah. You know, somebody's got to give them a door in. You know what I'm saying? It's got to be a place to start. Everybody can't be deep and profound and, you know, shocking and everything else. Hallelujah. <laughs> I sometimes wish I could be a little more, more palatable, you know. I'm like, <laughs> I want to open my Bible this morning. I'm going to jump back in where we were finishing last night. Now, if you put back up on the board, uh, uh, put back up on the screen, Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 23. I really want to look at these again and deal with, uh, I thought about not being too heavy on Sunday morning, but as I looked around, most of you have been here. And so I think I could continue to build and not just have to kind of give you a little uh, pat you on the head sermon for Sunday morning. <laughs> Is it okay? If I yeah, still yeah come on. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. But then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Say these words with me, but now. But now. Once. Once. In the end of the world. In the end of the world. This is my favorite end of the world scripture. <laughs> yeah. But now, once. In the end of the world, oh well, here's this word again. Ha! ha. ha. That don't mean he's going to. Right. Ha! He appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. I mean, that's not something he's going to do. That's something he already did. Amen. You know when he did that? In the end of the world. Amen. See, the end of the world is not a bad deal to me. It's real good news. Amen. Come on. Yeah. Hallelujah. See, how I many know that's not something he's going to do? That's something he already did. Is yeah. once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Next verse. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, and this one's a biggie to be preached everywhere, and they always pull this one little piece yeah. of scripture out of context. Yeah. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment, and then they give an altar call. Yeah. Not, not a bad idea, I guess. <laughs> Next verse. So Christ. Back up again. Back up one verse. Wow. Yep. And as it is appointed unto men wants to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ. so Christ. In other words, because you had an appointment with judgment and you had an appointment with death, so Christ. Come on, I know he was. He took your appointment. Come on, hallelujah. Amen. 
I know about you, but I'm not big about dentist appointments, some of that kind of stuff, and I'm glad when I found out some of them were canceled. But when I found out <laughs> that I had an appointment with death and an appointment with judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of any, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And I begin to realize because I had an appointment with death and with judgment, Christ was offered to meet that judgment so that as a believer, come on with me, hallelujah, my judgment's not my future, my judgment's in my past. Amen. Come on. Glory. Now, hallelujah. Now, that's some good news right there. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody said it's getting better. It's good news right there. It's getting better. Christ was once offered to bear the sin so that everything I had coming, he took everything I had coming so I could get everything he has coming. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I think that's powerful. He took everything. I, he was wounded for my transgression. He was bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement for my peace was laid on him. I, I, come on, I had a beating coming, but he yeah. took what I had coming. Yeah. So I could get what he had coming. Yeah. Amen. Uh, you know, the Lord took me to the scripture uh, back some time ago, and he said to me, I, I want you to, to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Yeah. And at first I thought, well, the Lord is dealing with me about my thought life. And so I got up the next morning and I thought, I am going to guard every thought that I have. And I'm going to bring every thought into obedience, into captivity to the events of Christ. And I got up and, and within an hour, I had had so many rogue thoughts. <laughs> and I'm trying to captivate these thoughts and bring them back in. And somebody, you know, you, you had no more got out of bed, got a cup of coffee in your hand, got in the car, somebody done pulled up in front of you. And you had a rogue thought. <laughs> Grab that one, bring it You know what I mean. Huh. I don't act like you've never been there. <laughs> And, man, so I, in an hour, I'm thinking, man, I never realized I had so many rogue thoughts. And the Lord said to me, I'm not talking about you chasing individual thoughts. Yeah. He said, but what you have done prior to this is you brought every thought, your whole thinking process, into captivity to the disobedience of Adam. Whoa. In other words, you're expecting what Adam's disobedience produced, rather than bringing your thoughts into captivity to what the obedience of Christ produced. Right. Right? Amen. How many of you bring your thoughts into what Christ's obedience produced? It's going to cast down all kinds of principalities and powers. Yes. Right. Every Amen. high thing, every imagination that lifts itself against the knowledge of God because yes. you're bringing your thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Somebody said, well, what did the obedience of Christ do? Well, Romans 5 says it like this, and I love the message by the one. It says, here it is in a nutshell. I like that. Yeah. Huh. He said, here it is in a nutshell. One man did it wrong and got us in all this trouble with sin and death. And another man did it right and got us out of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when I bring my thoughts into captivity to what Christ's obedience did. See, Adam's disobedience got me in trouble. Adam's disobedience brought sickness. Adam's disobedience brought disease. Adam's disobedience brought poverty. But I'm bringing my thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ because Jesus' obedience got me blessed. Jesus' yeah. obedience got me free from sin. Come on. Jesus' obedience got me free from Come a future on. judgment. Hallelujah. So when I bring my thoughts into captivity, all of a sudden, I'm not expecting bad things to happen. I'm expecting there is a confident expectation of good things in my life that I am now, because of what Jesus did, in a posture to receive. Come on, all of God's blessings in Christ are yes and amen. That's the captivity I want to bring. And I start to bring my thoughts into captivity to what Jesus' obedience did, rather than what the disobedience of Adam produced. Yeah. And even as I look at this Hebrew text where it says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of any unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. This is the only, this is where most everybody pulls their second coming text from. You know what's amazing now is that Jesus stood in front of Caiaphas, who was the high priest. And he says to Caiaphas, the high priest, and from henceforth, you will see. The Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, high and great glory. Jesus looked right in the eyes of God because he said, you will see. Praise yeah. God. And what, see, what we do is because we don't understand what's really being said here in this chapter. We think about puffy clouds out here in the sky someplace. And Caiaphas understood he was talking about the glory cloud that was in the most holy place. Yeah. That would go up off the mercy seat when the blood of sprinkling would be sprinkled on that mercy seat. That a cloud of glory would fill that house. And Jesus is saying, Caiaphas, when you go into the most holy place, what's going to happen is you're going to see the Son of Man appear there. And Caiaphas rent his robe and tore his robe because what he's saying is if he's the real priest, then I'm out of it. 
It was, un it was unusual for them to rend their clothes. But what he was saying is you're going to see the Son of Man appearing in the most holy place because God has received the sacrifice of sin. Not just for another year, not just the blood of atonement that covered your sin, but God has received the blood. Come on, hallelujah. And, and I tell you what they would do is with bated breath, the whole congregation of Israel would stand outside waiting to see when this high priest would enter beyond the veil with the blood of bulls and goats and he would splat that blood and walk up to the veil and God would sovereignly open the veil and he would walk into the most holy place and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. If this man lives, if he doesn't die in the most holy place, they, they are standing outside on the day of atonement waiting with bated breath to see if he will appear the second time. Because if he appears the second time, in other words, if he comes back out from beyond the veil and we see him, that means God has put away our sin for another Amen. year. And if you were a little Jewish boy standing outside, you could go lay your head on the pillow tonight and say, you know what? My sin has been dealt with for another year. I can have peace with God. Can I tell you, if we could do that under an old covenant, how much more under a new covenant should we know that the blood of sprinkling sprints better things than the blood of Abel, that what Jesus did was enough? Amen. Amen. We ought to be able to lay our head on the pillow and have peace with God. Because he has appeared already a second time Amen. without sin of the salvation. Amen. Now, let me take another difficult passage, if you would. Do you, do you have the amplified? But you don't have the back there, do you? I'm going to need some water here. Does anybody have an amplified Bible with you? Yes. You still have it. Go ahead and bring up Daniel, if you would. Daniel 9, uh, uh, at least in the King James and Wild, they're getting this for me. Daniel 9, verse 20. Uh, from King James, but I want to read it to you from the Amplified Bible because it does a lot of your homework for you. I like it when it makes it easier to say without me taking 400 hours to lay it out. Uh, Daniel 9, I want the Amplified if you get it. I have a sister clip it up for me. Thank you so much, sir. Hallelujah. I hate a dry preacher. <laughs> <laughs> you got the Amplified? All right. Uh, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, <coughs> whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, trust me, about the time of the evening oblation, he touches him at the very time Jesus would be on the cross. Right. Go ahead. Yet while I was speaking, all right, and, and he informed me and talked to me and said, O oh Daniel, I have now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Seventy weeks are determined upon my people. Now, uh, uh, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Number one, to finish the transgression. Number two, to make an end of sins. Number three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Number four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Number five, to seal up the vision. And number six, and the prophecy. And number seven, to anoint the most holy place. Would you read that for me from the Amplified Bible, my son? Let me just take my turn. I want verse 20. Yeah, that verse. 70 weeks of years or 490 years. 490 years are decreed upon our people. Are decreed upon your people and upon your holy city Jerusalem to finish and put an end to transgression, to seal up and make full the measure of sin, to purge away and make expiration and reconciliation for sin, to bring an everlasting righteousness permanent moral and spiritual rectitude in every area and relationship, to seal up a to seal up vision and prophecy and prophet and to anoint a holy of holies. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem until the coming of the anointed one, a prince shall be seven weeks of years and sixty-two weeks of years, it shall be built again with city square and moat but in troubled times. And after the sixty-two weeks of years shall the anointed one be cut off or killed and shall have nothing and no one and no one belonging to and defending him and the people of the other princes who will come. And, and the people of the other prince that will come. 
will destroy the city mm -hmm. and, and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and even to the end there shall be war and desolation and are decreed. And he shall enter into a strong and firm covenant with the many for one week, seven years. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and offering to cease for the remaining three and one half years. And upon the wing or pinnacle of the abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the full determined end is poured out on the desolator. Now here, here's, this, is, this is to me about the most powerful pieces of scripture yet. Yeah. Come back up again and, and read, give me, give me King James a minute. Just, uh, 924, I believe it was. I think so. Are we okay? Can I teach a little bit? Amen. 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 Seventy weeks of determined upon my people, up on thy holy sin, to make, uh, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal the vision of prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. How many of that's not your future? Amen. How many of Jesus did all of that? Yes. Right. Amen. I mean, he finished the transgression. Right. Amen. I mean, he made an end of sins. He condemned yeah. sin in the flesh. He made reconciliation for iniquity, and how many know he brought in everlasting righteousness? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. How many know he sealed up the vision and the prophecy because the vision and the prophecy is Jesus Christ is the spirit. Uh, the, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. Yes. I know he was the fulfillment of all the prophecies and the promises that God made to the fathers. He was the fulfillment. He yes. 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 And how many know he went, walked into the most holy place with his own blood and anointed the most holy place? How many know that's not in the future? Yes. Yes. Now, see, the reason I'm dealing with this is because this is the proof text that most prophecy teachers will use to teach you about a seven year future. Tribulation. I'm going to work on this this morning. Now, I'm going to in a mess, probably not. Yep. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and what we do is, what see, the, the big thing that everything hangs on is this tribulation period. Okay. The seven-year tribulation that most people think is still in their future. Right. Now, first of all, I showed you that this part that was supposed to happen in the middle of this last seven-year period right. is not in your future. It's in your past. Right. And so uh, Daniel sets a time text, and he said 70 weeks are determined upon my people. The Amplified Bible makes it clearer. It says 490 years are determined upon my people. 70 times 7. 490 years, 70 weeks of years, or 490 years are determined upon my people is what Daniel is saying. God is causing him to understand some stuff. So he says, 490 years are determined upon my people to finish the transgression, bring an end of sin, bring in all this stuff. He said, there's 490 years that's determined on it. He said, in the first 49 years, they're going to restore the wall and the city, but it's going to be built in troublesome time. If you go back to Ezra chapter 7, I believe it is. Uh, we can, I think I wrote down where it's at. Ezra, the seventh chapter. I'm taking my time so you can kind of write a few things down yourself if you want to. Let me think if I, I don't know if I brought it up with me or not. Ezra, the seventh chapter, I believe it is. I think, yeah, verse 11. Uh, can you bring that up? Verse 11, Ezra 7, King James. Are we okay still? Yeah. Yeah. Now this is the copy of the letter that the king our tax irks us. <laughs> <laughs> It'll help you remember this by saying that our tax, our tax irks, irks us. Irks us. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I burn into my mind what the name of this king is. Uh, the, king, the copy of the letter of the king Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even the scribe, of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of the statutes to Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, unto Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of God, of heaven, perfect peace, and at such a time. I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. For as much as thou art sent of the king and of his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of thy God which is in thy hand. What I want you to know is, listen, please, this to me I think is so important. The commandment to restore and build Jerusalem was given by King Artaxerxes 
in Ezra chapter 7 down to this verse. He gives the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. He's the king that did that. Now you said, what you ought to do is write that down over here in Daniel where it says, the, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince would be 483 years. I want you to know that King Artaxerxes gives this commandment in 457 B.C. Jesus comes up out of the waters of baptism in Jordan 27 A.D. counting one leap year for a zero year coming from B.C. to A.D. That is exactly 483 years from the time Artaxerxes got up and says, hey, let's restore and build Jerusalem. Exactly 483 years Jesus comes up out of the water and the beginning of the last seven year period of this prophecy is now in motion. Oh, I feel the Holy Spirit. I asked the Lord one time, I said, God, why in the world did you give them 70 weeks of years to, to, to come into this thing? He said, because a man must forgive until 70 times 7. And I'm locked into my own. Come on, hallelujah. I, in other words, I'm going to give them every opportunity to repent and come into the kingdom of God. I mean, the whole theme this week is repent, the kingdom's at hand. Metanoia, change the way you think. The moment you have a paradigm shift, the kingdom of God is one mind shift away. We are so close to seeing some happen. Yeah. We are in the place where I believe if we can change the way we think, you think there's massive shift in, there will be such a massive shift in the earth towards the kingdom of God. If we can just get people to see that a lot of stuff that they think is coming is not in their future, it's been over a long time ago. And we're going to wake up and almost be mad because we're going to think we should have been living in the kingdom for the last 2,000 years and we're living like strangers right in the land of promise, wandering around in the wilderness, wondering who we are and what we're here for. That's right. Here we are sitting around expecting and hoping it gets worse and worse. And you know, somewhere in my future is a seven year tribulation. And bless God, if you'll send in some money, I'll sell you seven dollars worth or seven years worth of dry food. I hope you're not buying into the scam. Yeah. yeah. Come on now. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to say it clear. They sold that, come on, in Y2K. They sold it back in the 80s. They decided, Look, I'm telling you, they keep, they keep on changing their books and saying, Whoop, say the Lord, I was wrong. Can I tell you, the tribulation is not in your future. That ought to make you jump up and down and shout hallelujah. If you're just, Somebody asked me, are you close, mid, or pre-trib? I said, I'm no trib at all. I believe the tribulation is not in my future at all. And I believe I've got good, sound, biblical exegesis to stand on. Is the fact that Jesus, the commandment went forth in Ezra chapter 7. Jesus comes on the scene. Yeah. 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 Amen. Exactly, exactly. This is not an accident. 483 years from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem so that the most time can be left of that 490 years. <coughs> is seven years. Now, what did Daniel say? He said the Messiah, the Prince, will come on the scene after 483 years. And he said he will be cut off in the middle. He said he will... Hallelujah. Right. Yeah. He, when the Messiah, the Prince, comes on the scene, right. he, in the midst of the week, he will cause the offering and the oblation to cease. I mean, that the reason he did was because after three and a half years of this last seven-year period, Wow. Yeah. Jesus was crucified. Yes. Yeah. Right in the middle of the last seven year period, what to do what? Make an end of sin. Yeah. Bring in everlasting righteousness. To seal up the vision. To anoint the most holy. He did all of that. Now what most prophecy teachers do with this is say, we got a parenthesis theory. Okay, they'll agree with me. Everything I taught you up to this point is 483 years. And then they say God stopped time and put a parenthesis and let 2,000 years pass. No way. And then he's going to fulfill the last seven years. There's no biblical precedence no. for it. There's no pattern extra biblical. And what we do is we got all kinds of stuff being taught. Come on. And to get out of the newspaper or talk about, come on, uh, you know what Obama's doing or what's happening in the Middle East or, or what kind of a moon is that. All that stuff is extra biblical. <laughs> and it fancies our mystery, come on, minds. And we think, well, the guy's smarter than I am, so 
He must be right. Can I tell you, you can get in the Word of God because this, uh, this view that I'm teaching, the only thing you've got to have to interpret today is the Bible. Amen. Amen. Yeah. It's yeah. not extra biblical. See, because when you compare spiritual things with spiritual things, you don't get in trouble. When you compare spiritual things with USA Today and try to make it fit in your time slot, you're going to be able to move dates and move them and move them and move them until finally somebody, you know, drops dead or they die and they don't have to answer the questions or they lied to you for years. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Come on. You know how many times some of the books have been rewritten and have talked about a future tribulation and a tribulation period? You know, and to me, look, y'all look at me kind of funny here a little bit this morning, but the truth of it is to me, just, just consider the possibility Come on. that you may not have a seven-year future hell on earth to walk through. Amen. Would that not be incredibly good news? Now, why the world they want to fight me about this is beyond me. Because you know what? I, I taught this in a huge Word of Faith church near Washington, D.C. My aunt was in the meeting. She said to me, she said, I've never had peace like I've had after I heard you teach some of this. She said, you know why I only had one child? She said, because of fear. Wow. Of what was coming on the earth. And she said, it robbed me of my family. She said, when I first heard it, it made me mad. Yeah. Because this stuff has robbed me of yeah. my future and my yeah. destiny. The reason we don't have young people wanting to embrace this message is because we told them you don't have a future, you don't have any hope. And I came a long way to tell you that your future is secure. Amen. I came a long way to tell you the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God is not going to turn it over to the devil and his crowd, not even for seven years. The devil is defeated. Adam Amen. is dead and Jesus is right now, Lord. That offends you. I'm sorry. Come on, but I'm gonna preach a great big God or we will defeat the devil until somebody gets excited about it. Amen. So my particular thought, my particular thought is this is a good time. Hallelujah. To be in there. It's a good time to get in the stock market. Amen. It's a good time to buy while it's low, because it's gonna turn around. Amen. God ain't done yet. Yeah, that's right. The earth is the Lord's, I said. The fullness there. He right. said in Psalm 2, ask me and I'll give you the heathen for your inheritance, the uttermost part of the earth for your possession. You look at me like, well, brother, how's what if you're wrong? Here's the deal. Everything we preach hangs on this seven-year deal. And they preach it. Jesus is going to come get you. Now, depending on what church you go to, Jesus is going to come get you. You're going to move to heaven for seven years. You're going to have pine turkey. <laughs> the rest of the world is going to go through hell. And the Jews are going to rebuild a temple and reinstitute animal sacrifice. And since the church is gone, the medium by which men can be saved, the Holy Spirit has been taken and evacuated from the earth with the people of God. So the Jews, without the Holy Ghost, are going to do in seven years what you couldn't do in 2,000 years with the Holy Ghost. Wow. And then after that, after everything falls apart, then we're going to fly back here and take over again. My deal is, why leave it all? Why not just take over? Yeah, amen. Why not just eat some pine turkey here? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Come on. And I prefer pecan. And you like pecan. I like coconut cream. Which is only two kind of pie I like. Hot and cold. Amen. It all tastes musty to me. Must he have another piece? <laughs> And the only thing that excites me about a red heifer is a prime rib about that thing. Oh, yeah. oh, it's the tabernacle. <laughs> See, to me, it is absurd when, you're, when your end time views lead you back to animal sacrifice. There's something wrong with this picture, folks. There's something wrong with this picture when it leads you back to a physical temple somewhere and doesn't make you realize you are the temple. Amen. It takes you back to a Jesus, come on, who lives somewhere on a planet three miles south of Mars than a Jesus who lives inside of you. Amen. Something wrong with that. How and I, you know, Jesus can do whatever he wants you. People say, well, don't you believe in a second coming? Yes, I do. I believe in a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. I can show you where Jesus showed up more than twice. He showed up on the road to Emmaus. He talks to the brothers there. He shows up in an upper room to the twelve. Thomas puts his hand in his side. He walks through a wall. He appears to over 500. That's at least five or six of them right there. Come on, somebody. Amen. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. I said there, there's more. Jesus is ever coming. He was. He is. And he is to come. Hallelujah. Can, can I get you to give me just two, two quick scriptures? 16 of Matthew, verse 28. Is this okay? Yeah. If you don't like it, just say, ah, oh, the guy's crazy. We're going back to normal here next week. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor said we ain't going back. Hallelujah. Remember last night. We ain't going back. Amen. Verily I say unto you, 
Jesus standing here talking, and we had red letters. You see, this was red letter edition. Verily I say, there be some standing here which will not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Jesus was standing on planet Earth telling these dudes, there's some of you right here that will not taste death. Yeah. Do you see me coming in my kingdom? That's not my opinion. That's what you're about to say. Yeah. Give you another one. Matthew 10, verse 23. See, see did, you, did anybody decide to be able to read some of these scriptures and have some trouble with them? Mm -hmm. oh, like, I don't see how this feels. But when they persecute you in this city, who you do another? For I say to you, you shall have not gone over, you, you shall not have gone over the city of Israel to the Son of Man become. Not my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus told me, you're going to see this in your generation. Matthew 24, verse 34, Jesus said, this generation will not pass away until everything I told you comes to pass, including a great tribulation such as was not since the world began or would ever be again. I think that's good news, or would ever be again. In other words, he's telling them, not a possibility of another one like this. Praise Amen. God. Oh, no. yeah. That's right. Praise God. Yeah. Now, how many of Jesus comes in the middle of the last seven year period and Messiah is cut off, the anointed one is cut off, but not for himself. He's cut off for the sins of the people. And he does exactly what Daniel 9 said he did. He made an end of sin. Amen. He condemned sin in the flesh. Amen. He brought in everlasting. Praise God. You see all the vision. He Thank did all of that. Man, yeah. you're in better shape than anybody has ever Amen. told you you were in. I wish you'd tell your neighbor, you're in better shape than anybody ever told you you was in. I know they're going to scare people to death all over America today. Hallelujah, churches. They're going to scare people. But I came to tell you, you are in better shape than anybody ever told you you was in. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Now, Messiah was cut off. There is three and a half years left of the scope of this 490 year prophecy. Am I making sense to you, sir? Yes. Jesus looks at his disciples. And I always wonder why this was. He said, now look, go first to Jerusalem, and then Judea, and then the other most part of the earth. And as I'm, I'm thinking about this thing, I'm thinking, the reason he told them to go first to Judea and Jerusalem is because there's still three and a half years left of this prophecy. 70 weeks are determined on my people. In other words, God has still got three and a half years left to deal with natural Israel. Man, there's a, I'm a massive here right now. Every, almost every parable Jesus taught was to try to get these people to realize the kingdom is here, and if you don't grasp it, it's going to be taken from you and given to a people that are bringing a nation bringing forth the fruit. And how many of them, it was about lights out for natural Israel. They had three and a half years left. How many of they killed the king of glory? A certain man let out of his vineyard to husband. Some, he, when he sent servants to see how the vineyards were, some of them they killed, some of them they stoned, others they ran out of their cities. Jesus said, last but not least, the owner of the vineyard said, I'm going to send my son. Surely they will receive wow. my son. Yeah. And then they killed the owner's son of the vineyard. What do you think he's going to do to the people who are supposed to keep the vineyard? He's going to cast him in outer darkness. They're going to be weeping and wailing. That's what he's talking about. And, and I call it Ganashi. Here's another parable. He puts forth another parable. He said a certain rich man, very sumptuous. That's natural Israel. He had the covenants of promise. And there was at the table a man by the name of Lazarus that said that he was begging for the cross. Now how many of the Samaritan woman who is a, uh, a, she's not Jewish, comes to Jesus and says, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. How many know that the, yeah. Lazarus is a picture of the Gentiles? The dogs eat crumbs. You see where I'm coming from? Right. Rich man is natural Israel. The dogs symbolize the, the, the non-Jews, the ones that they thought were a mongrel breed, and they are the dogs that are sitting under the table. But in the process of time, the rich man dies, he goes to hell. And Lazarus is carried into Abraham's bosom. The rich man in hell lifts up his eyes and he says, go tell my brother. See, he, the rich man, watch this. The rich man in hell lifts up his eyes and he says, he sees wow. Lazarus in Abraham's bosom and he says, Father Abraham. He uses the term of endearment. Father Abraham. And Father Abraham acknowledges him as a son. Greek word is technon, a born one, a natural seed of Abraham. And he says to him, 
send someone to warn my brothers. And he said, even though one would rise from the dead, they will not believe. I don't know if it ever dawns on us or not, but it was actually the Lazarus that was raised from the dead. And the moment Lazarus was raised from the dead, they sought to kill Jesus and Lazarus. And it was about to be lights out to natural Israel. I promise you, the moment Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, these scribes and Pharisees knew this story. And somebody came back and said, you ain't going to believe this, but this dude just raised somebody from the dead. I promise you, the Pharisees said, please tell me his name is not Lazarus. Oh, yeah. Wow. wow. I'm, about to, I'm about to come on, <laughs> I am beside myself. Amen. Do you see the picture of what's going to see? Once you get the keys, everything's going to fall in place. Yes. yes. It fits in context. You don't have to twist it. You don't have to wrestle it. You don't have to do anything. You just see Jesus in these parables is trying to get these people to come into the covenants of promise. Praise God. And once they kill him, they still got three and a half years still to come into the redemption of their Messiah who paid the ultimate price. So I, as I looked at this thing, and I thought, well, they went preaching then right after this. Right. And they're preaching to Jerusalem and to Judea and to the uttermost part of the earth, like Jesus told them to do. And so I said, I wonder when the clock strikes midnight of 490 years. I wonder when the 490 is over. Guess what it happens? When Stephen stands up. Oh. And said, if you by wicked hands have crucified the Lord of glory. And they picked up rocks and started to stone that dude. Because Jesus said, I must set to every enemy have been made my footstool. But when they stoned Stephen, and Stephen said, Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit, Jesus stood up. <laughs> Stephen said, I see the Lord standing at the right hand. And when Jesus stood up, he said, this is it. 490 years have expired. Saul is standing there holding the garments of those who are stoning them to death. And God said, Saul of Tarsus is about to become Paul the Apostle because I'm going to take this thing to the Gentiles. Amen. God Amen. Amen. The door. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Israel as a nation blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Stepped out of covenant. God said, it is lights out. And I believe they did not receive their forgiveness as a nation. I don't believe in, I believe individuals could be saved, but I really believe that when you deal with the unpardonable sin, it's not talking about some individual sin, it was a national sin. And what God did, even with that, was he drew a bigger circle. Somebody said, are you preaching replacement theology? No, I'm preaching placement theology. Amen. Come on, I believe he, he, come on, I believe he purposed us in him before the foundation of the earth. We were placed in him. But what he simply did was draw a bigger circle and said to both Jew and Gentile, there's only one way in through the covenants of promise. Amen. And that's through the blood of a spotless right. lamb. There's no other deal on the table. I don't care what these other guys are telling you. They're trying to tell you the Jews don't even need to get saved. they got a special deal. That's absurd. There is no other way that you can come into the covenants of promise but by the blood of Jesus. Come on. There is no other name given under heaven. I'm going to lift his name up. You do whatever you want to do with it. But I'm going to tell you, there's no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. But at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will swear that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I tell you, if we need to lift up the name of Jesus and begin to declare that some of this stuff is not in your future, it is behind you and God has brought us into a place where we don't have to look forward to a hell on earth. We look forward to the kingdom of God becoming like leaven and filling the whole earth. That's what I look forward to. Amen. So Amen. how does it end? I don't think it ends in catastrophe. I think it ends in redemption. Amen. I think it ends in restoration. Amen. Well, let's go back and see how it was for God messed up. Give me, give me Genesis. I don't want to be here all day. Let me... Let me, let me try to see if I can circle the land here. <laughs> Genesis 1, I think it is about probably verse 6. About verse 6. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. Now watch this for a moment. We'll go ahead next verse, I think. God made the firmament and divide the waters which were under the firmament 
from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Now stay with me for a moment. The waters that are above the firmament, or the expansion, hang in what we call clouds. If you think that's a fair assumption, say amen. 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 The waters that are beneath the firmament have been gathered into oceans, rivers, seas, ponds, oceans. I could preach this at any Baptist church. They'd be with me so far. Okay. Right. How many believe that's a fair assumption? Say yes. amen. Yes. Amen. So that we are standing, you and I, between the above water and the beneath water. We are standing in the firmament. Do you think that's a yes. fair assumption? Yes. Say amen. 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 Not trying to trick you. Amen. <laughs> How many believe we're standing in the front of Let me see you. Yes. Amen. Right now. We're between the above water, beneath water, unless you're in the water. <laughs> and you could be. <laughs> and it was so. Next verse. And God called where we're standing at right now. <laughs> Capital. Yeah. H-E-A. Yeah. Yep. That's right. Oh, my God. The book of the beginnings, yes. heaven, yes. was right here. Yes. That's right. Wow. That's where it is. Wow. What happened to the brother house? Adam raised hell. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just like I said it. God didn't create hell. Death and hell was released by Adam. Yep. Wow. And I, I don't want to leak too much information, but I believe God wants to get rid of what Adam leaked. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Right. <laughs> and death and hell are cast into the lake of fire after a oh, while. Hallelujah. Yeah. He wants to get rid of that. Yeah. 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 Yes. Come on. That's right. Woo. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. He called the, the firmament heaven so that we are right now standing in the firmament. Now see, Adam released death and hell on the planet because when sin came, the whole world began to take on the form. And Adam had a garden. He turns it into a great garden. But Jesus is going to take a graveyard, turn it into a garden. Amen. Adam's going to have access to a tree of life, and he's going to choose a tree of death. But Jesus is going to choose a tree of death and give us a tree of life. Amen. Adam is going to have dominion, has a bird can fly as deep as a fish can swim. But when the second Adam comes on the scene, he's going to give us dominion higher than a bird can fly and deeper than a fish can swim. Because there's nothing above him and nothing below him. Come on, somebody. Amen. That he hath made us sit together with him in the heavenly places. So, come on, that what happens is, is that thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What's God doing? He's restoring. He's redeeming. He's putting it back like it was before it got messed up. How many of them death and hell came by one man? How many of them has been released by another one? Jesus became the gate of heaven. He was the house of God. He was the spout where the glory came out. He was the place the angels of God ascend and descend. He was the gate of heaven. The old man was the gate of hell. The new man is the gate of heaven. The gates of heaven in here today. Lift up your hands, O your gates. He lifted up to the everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Amen. You are windows, doors, and gates. You are the porthole into glory. Amen. Not Come on. Not a man. It was the interface, the connecting place. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. God leaned over the balconies of glory while angels gave him glory. And I think Michael probably looked over Gabe and said, he outdid himself yesterday with them cows. I wonder what he's going to make today. <laughs> and God said, let's make a man in our image. After our likeness, let him be to the blue ball called earth what we are to the invisible realm called heaven. Let's give him dominion high as a bird can fly and as deep as a fish can swim. And Michael probably looked at Gabriel and said, we're about to see what God would look like if he were visible. And about that split second in time, God comes down on a lump of red clay and like the hand of a great potter, he begins to shape his image, his likeness. He molds it into a lump of red clay. He might have done it like a snow angel. He might have just made a divine impression. <laughs> but he's got a chunk of dirt a lump of red clay and Mike looks at Gabe and says yeah but he's out of the earth he's earthy he can only have access to the realm of the earth God said the day's not over and about that time God ascends into the deepest depths of spirit substance fills his lungs with the breath 
Come on. Hallelujah. Of Numa. Hallelujah. And Nefesh is the Hebrew word for it. And he comes down on this man who was only made out of dust. He's only made out of dirt. And God gives him mouth to mouth resuscitation. And God breathes into his nostrils the breath from the invisible realm. And Adam becomes the interface that connects the visible and the invisible. The human and the divine. Heaven and earth are met together in the person of a son. Hallelujah. God's meeting place is in a man. Amen. Hallelujah. And the first man disconnects from the divine source. Oh, too much to preach here this morning. He knowingly, the woman was deceived. He was not deceived. I could see God look and say, He's going to leave us. He's going to leave us to cleave to his woman. He's going to leave us today. I can see if I can say, why? Well, how do you know that, God? He said, it's because it's what I would do. I would leave heaven too to go join myself to a bride. The first Adam did it out of rebellion. And the second Adam did it out of obedience. <laughs> he came down. Come on and reconnected himself to a woman in the earth and when his side was open on Calvary's cross it was very similar to the rib of Adam being opened in Eden's misty garden and when the spear of a Roman soldier opens the side of Jesus blood and water came out and it was the blood and water that cleansed you of every spot every wrinkle every blemish not any such thing so that at that point on Calvary's cross you got married to him 2,000 years ago because he got joined to his bride again and you see somebody said, boy, you know, if you can get this, you just, you know, if you just send in some more money, we're going to get this church called the bride cleaned up, get all the spots and wrinkles out of it because the Bible said Jesus is coming back for a church not having spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing. You know, that's not the Bible. Got real quiet when I said, not in the scripture. We put it so long, we think Jesus is coming back. To get married to us somewhere in the future when we get rid of our spots, wrinkles, or blemishes. Oh, Number one, yes. I already got rid of my spots on Calvary's tree. Amen. Amen. Yes. Number two, come on. Thank you. How, what the scripture actually says, Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Yes. Amen. That he might present her to himself, not having spot, wrinkle, blemish. Right. You don't care what the world thinks about you, right. he presented you to himself. Yes. Not having a spot, not having a wrinkle, not having a blemish for any such thing. And I believe on Calvary's tree, when he's hanging suspended between the heavens and the earth, he is in and out of consciousness. He is in the moments of his death, and his mother is standing beneath the cross weeping. If there's anything that would make me climb down off of the cross, it would be my mama saying, that's my baby. That's the one. I've got all my eggs in this basket. I believe he was the one. Jesus in the moments of his passion, looks down from Calvary's cross. He does not use a term of endearment to address her. He uses a prophetic term. He says, woman. Woman! Behold your son. He's trying to give her some comfort in his dying moments. Because what he's trying to do is shock her mind into an ancient prophecy that says the seed of a woman will bruise the head of the serpent. Oh, yes, that's and right. And he's saying, Mama, you're the woman, and I'm the seed. Yes. Hold yes. on, Mama. Hallelujah. Praise God. Woman, behold your yes. son. Son. And he looks at John and he says, Son, behold. Your mother. He gives his mother into the care of John. A few moments later, he will lean back and say, Elo, Elo, Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What he is doing is he is leaving his father and his mother, and he's cleaving to his bride. Except the first son did it in disobedience, and the second son did it through obedience. And he gets remarried on the Calvary's cross so that you are not going to get married to him. You are already married. And if you're not married, if you're not already married to him, it is illegal to use his name. And it is illegal to be intimate with him. Come on, right. The new covenant is your marriage certificate. No wed, no bed. 
No covenant, no love in it. <laughs> That'll preach. That'll preach. <laughs> and he gets married on Calvary's cross. Praise God. Yes. Let me try to find a place to land. Go to 21 quickly, Revelation, very quickly. Have, have, I, have I opened? Can, can, am, is something sparking inside? I, I understand Amen. that I cannot give you all the answers in two or three services, and I will create more questions for you than I will answers. But if you start asking questions, you're going to start getting some more answers. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's yeah. right. Yeah. And what's happening is we can, religious systems don't want you to ask any questions. Yeah. So we just content to live, hallelujah, way below what's possible for us. Yeah, right. The end result. Somebody said, how do you think it's going to end up? I think it's going to end with heaven on earth. Genesis 1, restoration and redemption. Yeah. If you're going to read something, you've got to figure out how it was before it got messed up, or was heaven at it was here. I mean, if Jesus, when he came, says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth, he became the interface where heaven and earth came together because the human and the divine, he was born of the seed of Mary, but his father was not Joseph. His father was God. He was human and divine, yes. visible, right. invisible. Right. And just like Adam, Adam knew God. Come on, he knew angels by their names, but he also walked in the visible realm. I believe God is bringing us to the place where we have access to both realms. Yes. The right. visible and the invisible, the heavens right. come on, and the yes. earth are not as far away as you think they are. Amen. 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 Praise God. It's not even a long distance call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I, I challenge you this morning that if God were to open our eyes, this room is full of an amphitheater. Yes. Of our loved ones who have gone on before the Hebrews says are cheering us on to their finish line. They're saying, don't stop now. Yeah. There's some pieces coming. Come on, let's put it all back together because it's all about to merge again. Come on, somebody's going to get yeah. both the visible and the invisible are coming back together again. Every now and then you get glimpses of it. Every now and then one of them shows up like Moses and Elijah show up on the mountain of transfiguration and heaven and earth. Come on, bump into each other. Come on, somebody. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Now see, to me that really just that primarily says a new covenant. A new heaven and a new earth in the Jewish mindset was dealing with a new covenant, a new age, a new, a new time and period. A new era. How many know that the end of the world was not the end of a global situation? It was the end of that age. That's what the Greek word is, is eon. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. I don't have time to deal with all of this, but I would simply ask you, what do you see? Do you see a new heaven and a new earth? Do you see an old one? I see, when I look at you, a new creature, new tongues, mercy that's new everyone. Yeah. New, yeah. I see a new covenant. I see a new heaven and a new earth. I see a new Jerusalem. I, I see a new... <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you see? <laughs> see, that's the deal. What, see, the book of Revelation starts out by saying, come and see. Yes. Come and see. And it ends with, and, and I saw. Yes. 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 See, that's why I came here. Because I wanted to say, come and see. And I hope when I leave here, you can say, and I saw. Amen. I might have saw more than I wanted to see because it might cost me some friends. <laughs> but you're looking at somebody that's absolutely dangerous because I could care less about being any more famous. I am more passionate for truth than anything else. And I saw a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Look here at the icon he uses. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So now he uses two icons, a bride adorned for her husband. What's the next verse say? And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is a minute. He would love with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and shall be their God. He uses three things to describe the same thing. The tabernacle of God. Yeah, right. I mean, the tabernacle of God is not a place. It's a people. Yeah. Amen. Well, no, you're not. You are the temple. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Of the Holy Ghost. God moved out of that temple into this one. Yeah. Amen. Then he uses the term, I saw the bride, the lamb's wife. I mean, that's not a place. It's a people. Amen. I submit to you that the city of God is not a place, it's a people. Amen. It is the, it is the, come on, hallelujah. How many know he says in Hebrews chapter, I believe it is chapter 11 or 12, for you are come. Yes. You are not coming to, you are come to Mount Zion and you have come to the city of the living God. 
and you are built upon the foundation of the apostles of Christ Jesus Christ himself being the chief of Christians. The capital city where the king lives is in this room. Amen. Made out of lively stories that are fitly framed together. Touch your neighbor and say, you've been framed. <laughs> to build a habitation for God through the Spirit. Now, if you could give me this in the Message Bible, I'm going to close. Because I have dumped out a truckload on Sunday morning, and I am never this heavy on Sunday morning. But I didn't have a Sunday night, so I had to give it to you. <laughs> And I heard a voice thunder from the throne. Look, look, God has moved into the neighborhood. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Woo! Making his home with me. Yes. Praise God. There is God. Or he's their God. They are his people. He's their God. Yes. Amen. Yes. That has been the heart cry of God since Genesis. Amen. Amen. That's right. Let them build me a house. Because I want to live with them. Yeah. All my life I was raised to believe that God's primary goal was to get me from here to there. And I do believe there's a there. I just don't want to go there this morning. And then I started reading the scripture. And God, every since Genesis, has tried not to get me from here to there. He's been trying to get what's happening there. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And he told Moses when he took him up the mountain and showed him the pattern of the tabernacle. He said, if you build in the earth what I just showed you in the heavens, I will come and live with you. Hallelujah. Let them build me a house so I can dwell among them. The first house that was fitting was Jesus. But he said this. You destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll raise it back up. And how many of you destroyed the physical body of his temple? Three days later, he got it back up. And I tell you that you can look at it this way too. A day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. Jesus was here day before yesterday. This is the morning of the third day. And there's lively stones in this room. And there's a house that God is building so he can fill it with all the fullness. Praise God. Amen. And then he rears back and says this. He said, look, look, God. Has moved into the neighborhood. <laughs> Property values just went up. <laughs> and then he makes this incredible, incredible good news statement. <coughs> he said, just a few verses below this Behold, I'm just going to make everything new. I'm going to start a major renovation program. Here's the deal I'm going to make it all. And he tells John, write this down. These words are true. They're faithful. Praise God. Now say, if any man is thirsty, let him come. Drink the water of life freely. Stand on your feet.